Hello everyone, I'm Heath and it is time to check out Against the Dark Master. So this is going to be kind of a flip through, read through, learn to play kind of video because I have had two or maybe three different people in the comment sections of my videos say that I need to check out Against the Dark Master for different reasons, including its initiative system, which I want to look at uh, in particular, but then also its general uh, feel and updating of MURP. And as you know, MURP, the Middle Earth role-playing game, we covered in a series of videos uh, on this channel as well. And I didn't know about Against the Dark Master, but it seems like, as I flipped through this document before, that it is kind of a, a refresh of MURP. But this time it has been stripped of uh, Middle Earth and the Lord of the Rings. Now, I think it's been very interesting that in the comment section, I, I have heard from a lot of people on my YouTube channel and other places talk about how fantastic they think the One Ring is for its rule system that helps to facilitate and capture the feel of Middle Earth and, you know, adventuring in, uh, you know, the Lord of the Rings, the Hobbit, that style of, uh, of play in, the, uh, in Middle Earth. And it seems like, generally speaking, people agree with the idea that uh, Iron Crown Enterprise's uh, manifestation of kind of an adjustment of the role master system, which was MERP for uh, Middle Earth, didn't exactly fit its feel. Although I've had other people in the comments section be like, oh, Lord, the, uh, the One Ring role-playing game has completely missed its mark. It's just a glorified uh, board game, and you really need to go back to MERP if you want to have a game system for... Uh, the the Lord of the Rings. So it's really interesting that here with uh, with Against the Dark Master, they've clearly tried to capture from a mechanical perspective everything Merp was trying to do. But because it is freed from uh, Lord of the Rings and Middle Earth, we don't have to evaluate it as you know is this capturing the feel of that particular world. We can just say this is a cl a classic game of fantasy adventure, as it says and evaluate it on its own terms as, you know, something that could possibly do uh, Middle Earth, but they have a long list of different uh, franchises as well and uh, intellectual properties that have inspired them to create this, and so I I'm pretty interested. So as you can see here with the cover, it's deliberately invocative of uh, the predecessor of MERP. This is, um, I don't remember exactly what it is, but it was like Lord of the Rings role-playing game or something like that. There was the thing that existed, that pre-existed MERP and it has a cover that is very much like this, and so obviously Against the Dark Master is trying to invoke that. And this is just the quick start rules. I downloaded the quick start rules, so there's a lot more. I would love to see the full rule book, but this is just the quick start rules, so we're just gonna go over them here. And it says, we're coming to Kickstarter October 22nd. I'm not sure what year that is, but I'm pretty sure that the, the basic Kickstarter has already uh, passed by. I do think that it's nice that this work is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 Unported License. So this license allows you to freely reduce, remix, reuse, and share this text of the book under the following conditions, that you do so for only non-commercial purposes. You attribute open-ended games incorporated and you license any derivative under the same license. So of course that's nice that we can create things from it, because I might be potentially interested in uh, the rule system here, because as you may know, I've got a couple of different worlds that I want to bring out as role-playing games. And so I would potentially be interested in evaluating this one, but uh, it does hurt that uh, you can't use it for any commercial purposes, because I would certainly want to be able to sell the kind of things that I develop. So that's interesting. It does hurt, though. We will see how things go. So here we do have the uh, sources of inspiration for Against the Dark Master. J.R.R. Tolkien is right here, but also Ursula Kaylee Gwynn. And I like that because I was a, a fan of her books, The Wizard of Earthsea. Those were also some very early fantasy books that I read. The Two Terrys, Brooks and Goodkind, and their followers, Weiss and Hickman, Jordan, and Williams. But it's also inspired by great fantasy movies of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. From the sword and sorcery genre, such as the Lord of the Rings cartoon from Ralph Bakshi. Think of the cheap 80s barbarian movies. Think of the heartbreaker movies a whole generation was raised to. Dragon Slayer. I watched that. Crawl. Labyrinth. Clash of the Titans. Legend. So that's kind of what they're going for here. So I don't want to get too detailed with all of the different rules here because it is definitely a refresh of MERP. So if you have been through the videos I've already done on MERP, 
that's basically what we're doing here as far as a D100 system. Uh, this is D100 and that you are uh, rolling D100 modified by different skill levels. That's basically what's going on uh, to try to roll over some number, but there are a lot of different charts to reference just like there were in MERP. It does have open-ended rolls like MERP did. I remember that it was difficult for us to find that uh, in the, uh, the last videos, but unmodified rolls between 96 and 100 on your D100. You must pick up the dice and roll again, adding that result to the first one. If the result is 96 or more, you must keep rolling and adding together until you have 95 or less. On the other hand, if your dice come up with an unmodified roll between 0 and 5, you roll again and subtract, and you keep going down. So on open-ended rolls, you've got a potentially explosive capacity uh, on the upside, but then also potentially no downside as well. You can keep going down and down and down. Creating a character. Let's just look at its quick guide here and the checklist. Generate your stats. Generate your character's stats by distributing 50 points between your stats. Minimum of 0, maximum of 25. I don't have the stat list right here right now. Choose your kin and culture, which choose your character's kin, modifying your stats accordingly and take note of your special traits. Choose your character's culture and assign your cultural traits. Choose your vocation. I suppose that's like class. Choose your character's vocation and distribute your development points. Background and equipment. Determine your background options. Take note of your character's starting gear and possessions. Choose your passions. So that's kind of like their uh, alignment or what they're doing instead of. They've got passions, motivation, nature, and allegiance. You know, Merp tried to do a little bit more than just Dungeons and Dragons did with alignment. But, uh, you know, maybe it wasn't as, as great as it could have been. And so they're trying to use something different than alignment here, I felt, but try to improve it and modernize it with this idea of motivation, nature, and allegiance. Calculate derived attributes, move rate, defense, save roll, bonus, etc., and then give your character a name. So our stats here are brawn, swiftness, fortitude, wits, wisdom, bearing. I believe that's it. Yes. So we got, uh, what is that, five or six? One, two, three, four, five. Fortitude, wits, wisdom, and bearing. And I think that's a pretty good spread. Most of us know exactly what those are. Uh, you know, I, I've kind of tried to develop my own kind of system of attributes, and we looked at that when we were developing the Journey to the Tree of Sorrows RPG, even though we ultimately decided to go with just the classic Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition statistics. But, you know, in many ways, it seems like people are kind of converging on the same kind of statistics. I'm not a fan of the raw Dungeons & Dragons statistics, but here we have fortitude, we have wits, we have wisdom, so you've got kind of got that classic Dungeons & Dragons division between intelligence and wisdom, bearing, which is like uh, charisma, and then we have fortitude, which is kind of like constitution. Oh, and then swiftness, which is like your dexterity, right? And so you distribute 50 points among those, and it gives you some examples right here, and those are going to become your basic bonuses for anything based on any of those attributes that you're doing. Then you have kins here, and of course, with all the different inspirations that are coming here to create against the Dark Master, this is basically kins, basically what they're saying, instead of races, we've got elves, dwarves, massive trolls, stunted orcs, and that each one of these different kins has a different modifier for a bunch of different things. We can see brawn, swiftness, fortitude, wits, wisdom, that's bearing uh, hit points, the maximum hit points, I believe MP is magic points, I believe this is, has to do with your toughness saving throw, and this has to do with your will saving throw. I forget what BG and LG are at the moment, but as you can see, we've got Dwarf, Halfling, Man, High Elf, Half Elf, Dusk Elf, Silver Elf, Star Elf, Half Orc, Orc, Dark Troll, uh, Stone Troll, and Dark Troll all across here, and here are all your different modifications. And these do definitely seem inspired by all of the different races in MERP. If you were trying to port this over to a... Middle Earth game, I can see how you wouldn't have uh, that much difficulty in doing that. Oh, BG, this value represents the initial amount of background points available for a specific kin. And then WL, this value represents a oh, wealth level uh, provided by the specific kin. Okay, so that's then. So we've got all of our kin descriptions here. I don't think there's a need to go through these in great detail. Man, high man, you can tell that's like our general uh, human being, and this would be like our uh, Numenorians or Numenorian blooded or something like that. Dwarves, halfling, dusk elf, star elf, 
and then we get to cultures. So our basic fantasy stuff was covered up above. And I understand that that table included kins that are not available here in the Quick Start Guide. This is just the Quick Start Guide. There is more uh, information on those kins, as I understand it, in the main uh, rule book. So cultures, which influences, looks like cultural skill ranks, passion, and starting wealth level. And then here is our cultures description, deep, fey, woad, noble, pastoral, city. So I guess that's a lot of different combinations you could have. So I suppose you could be like a pastoral man or a noble high man or a woad elf or something like that. So we're trying to get outside of, I guess, every species being monolithic. So you combine this, uh, this kin with the, uh, the culture. So that's interesting. Cultural skill ranks table. So here you go here uh, with all the different cultures across. And then I guess these are all of your skills. Armor, blunt, these are different kinds of weapons right here. And a, a skill list that looks also kind of reminiscent of MERP. It's got a bit, a bit more, I think. But generally speaking, remember we have the very defined skill list in MERP. We have that again here. And then cultural wealth and outfits table. This helps you figure out exactly what you should have. You know, I suppose I like this because... You know, I'm for fast character generation, and I haven't generated a character in against the uh, Dark Master, but I do like things that allow us to get to the table faster, and so knowing, like, here's the stuff you get, like, uh, you know, hand axe and shield, short sword and sling, hunting bow and arrows. Okay, fantastic. There you go. No need to spend a whole lot of time shopping for everything item by item before the game even gets going. So, vocation... So everyone has a vocation, which represents a mix of innate aptitude and specific intense training. So I guess this is kind of like class. So we do have, yes, things like wizard, uh, warrior, rogue, animist, spell, lores. We're going to get to spells right here. So wizard lore spells, animist spell lores, elven spell lores. Basically your spell lists vocation development points and vocational benefits. So if you're a warrior, you're going to get a plus 20 in your first skill choice as it relates to combat because you're a warrior, but also, I guess, second, third, and fourth, and fifth skill choice. But wizards don't get that. Rogues get a few things. That's an interesting way to do it. Rather than locking you into things, just choose the ones that you want to have. We've got the skills sorted into a number of different categories. Armor, combat, adventuring, so athletics, ride, hunting, nature, and wandering, and then roguery, acrobatic, stealth, lock, pay, locks and traps, perception, deceive, lore, and the spell casting, and then body. Body, that's the, the one that has to do with hit points and is body development. You know, Merp had body development for your hit points, and that was kind of the one that was the one-off that helps you develop, I suppose, you know, yourself physically in order to get more hit points, and that has carried over into Against the Dark Master here. Skills. Uh, it does have the skill ranks, and, you know, being that Merp was one of my first experiences with a role-playing game, the idea of having the different uh, ranks here that helps you out and giving a different bonus was the way that I kind of thought skills worked, and they have carried that over into this. So the first 10 ranks in a given skill give a plus 5 bonus each, the second 10 plus 2 each, and then each subsequent rank gives plus 1 each. So, you know, you get a certain amount of skill ranks, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're getting a linear bonus. It's not exactly linear based on the number of skill ranks that you put into a particular skill, because the first ones let you advance rather quickly, but then you get diminishing returns as you put more into it, and then further diminishing returns as you put even more ranks into them. And then here are all of our skill descriptions right here. Here are our backgrounds. And generally speaking, I'm for different backgrounds. I like having backgrounds. And we've got a bunch of different things here. We've got kin, we've got culture, and then we've got background and vocation. That's quite a number of things to interface. Uh, you know, Dungeons & Dragons, you have your, your race, your class, and then some kind of background. So that's three. But I do like the idea of having some uh, skills or other abilities based on something that is in a background. So they have that here. So passions and drives. So this is, I guess, the kind of thing that replaces alignment. So passions are statements that tell something significant about the character, why they went adventuring in the first place, and the reason why they fight and stand, how they deal with difficult, dangerous situations, and who they're sworn to and serve, or have decided to fight and destroy. So we've got three of these, motivation, nature, and allegiance. 
So motivation is what pushes the character forth, a goal set either in the near future or in the farthest, a personal belief or strong convention. Examples of good motivations are, I will find out the fables, or I will find, I will find the fabled sword of Tuthua and prove myself worthy of wielding it. I will wipe out the orcs that burned down my village and killed my family. Nature is how a character behaves in most circumstances due to their inherent instincts, demeanor, or ethical philosophy and conventions. Trust no one and have your sword ready. Or as a holy knight, I am sworn to protect the meek, avenge the wrongs, and fight evil. Allegiance is who the character is loyal to or loves or, on the other hand, has sworn to destroy. Such as the love for my family drives me forward or I will follow my companion and master Eloran wherever our path leads us. Okay. So you choose these during character creation. Creating interesting passions is a collective process that really must involve all the players at the table since it's vital for a VSD. That's the abbreviation for Against the Dark Master. Game to come alive and vibrant, with, uh, come alive with interesting and vibrant characters and also an excellent opportunity to tie characters to each other and to NPCs in the story. So they may change during play. Yeah, for instance, the reason why the passion existed in the first place ceases. I guess you accomplish things. Characters undergo heart-rending or mind-bending experiences, or they change their mind about a belief system. So what do these do? So that was so that was motivation. Uh, let's see. Oh no, that was just in general what they are. So the first one is drive. So drive is a measure of how strongly a character is motivated and how far they would push themselves to get what they are after it fluctuates during play. Oh, we got a value assigned here. Drive value can never be less than zero or more than five. A character starts the game with a drive of one. Drive increases by pushing the game forward with one's self passions. Whenever a character willingly puts himself into dangerous situation or in a challenge, puts himself in a bad light because of one of their passions, or makes the story change in a new and interesting direction by following their passion, they get to increase their drive score by one. Okay, so spending drive points. So what they here's what they do. Drive points can be spent by the player to mitigate harmful effects suffered by their character during the game, to get another chance after failing a roll, or to perform heroic deeds that would otherwise be impossible for them to accomplish. So spend one or more drive points to get a special plus 10 bonus per drive point spent on any skill, attack, or save for the duration of the current scene, which is a whole combat, a travel hazard, or entire negotiations. Spend them before rolling the dice. Rerolled any failed roll with a special plus 10 bonus. If the reroll fails again, the character can spend another drive point to roll another time, adding another plus 10 on top of that and so forth and so on. Reroll a suffered critical strike. This is obviously being kind of an updated merp. We are definitely going to have criticals in this game, and so a lot of people will be excited about that, unless you happen to be the one who is receiving the critical, and in which case I suppose you may uh, use one of these drive points to reroll a suffered critical, lowering its severity level by one, but you must abide by the new roll. But you can do it again if you want. A character can also spend five drive points at once to consider the result of an open-ended attack skill or spell roll as a natural 100 after rolling the dice. Treat a critical strike they scored as slaying. This can be chosen after the attack roll. And I think that this is one of the categories of criticals as I was reading through this the first time. You know, in MERP, we had A, B, C, D, E, F, G <laughs> criticals. Maybe it's through F. A, B, C, D, E, F criticals. And in Against the Dark Master, the criticals have different uh, and more descriptive uh, levels. And so I think slaying is the most severe critical you can have. Or ignore all penalties to actions from wounds and adverse conditions for the duration of the scene. So wait a minute. I don't think there was... We got drive here. We say we have three different passions. Motivation, nature, and allegiance. So motivation is what drives you forward. So maybe you just have one of these? No, each player chooses up to three passions for their character during creation and writes them down. There are three standard passions. So you could have a motivation, nature, and allegiance. Motivation is what pushes you forward. Nature is how you behave in most situations. And allegiance is who you're loyal to or who you have sworn to destroy. But then here... Oh, okay, so drive is overall. I thought this was tied to each one of those specific passions, but it's not. So we can have up to three passions, one in each one of those categories, but our drive category, it seems like, is, is overarching. So, you know, if you've got something, you know, you could get these drive points, it sounds like, during the game because of your allegiance down here. 
or because of your nature or because of your motivation if these uh, are met here like willingly putting yourself into danger or a challenge or whatever because of any one of those okay so i got you there so we've got passions those can be up to three different things and those give you drive points then we move on to finishing touches move rate Everybody has a move rate of 15, meaning they can move up to 15 meters at walking pace or up to 30 meters when sprinting each round. Defense, a character can shield themselves by, from harm by wearing armor and other protections, but their ability of deflecting or evading incoming blows is represented by their defense score, or DEF for short. A character's DEF is equal to their swiftness score or zero, whichever is higher, and swiftness is one of our main uh, attributes. And then you can temporarily improve this, or I suppose uh, decrease this as well. Saving throws. We have a toughness saving throw and a willpower saving throw. And I think this is this is pretty good. This is also a direction that I'm kind of going in, especially if you're thinking about having the characters, the players roll more dice, that if something is going to affect them, it's probably either going to affect them in a physical way, which would be resisted by toughness, or in some type of mental way, which is resisted by willpower. So a character's, uh, uh, that's toughness bonus is equal to their fortitude stat, plus five times their current level, plus their ken bonus and special modifiers. Their wisdom, or their willpower save, is equal to their wisdom stat, plus five times their current level, plus their ken bonus and special modifiers, your hit points are equal to body skill bonus. See, this tends to make me think that this is not uh, generally what I would call an inflationary hit point system, because over here, you know, we do have something about your current level adjusting your saves, but it's not, your current level is not adjusting your hit points. So it seems like you may use different skills, perhaps you get more skills as you level up to develop your body, but that's okay, then you're sacrificing something else for having more hit points. It's not that just hit points are continuously inflationary. That's the way it seems anyway. Each character's total hit points is equal to their body skill bonus. See another section for more information. You also have magic points, which allow you to cast spells. At first level, characters start with one magic point for each 10 full points in their MP stat. I guess that's your magical stat, which is wits, which is like intelligence, I suppose, for wisdoms, for wizards, and then wisdom for animists, and then uh, BEA, which was bearing, I believe it was, for all other vocations. The character's kin bonus and vocation MP are gained in addition to that. Starting equipment, so we are just said you just get what was on that list, plus you also get some traveling clothes, a way to hold your weapons, blah, 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 so that sounds good, and then you give it a name. All right, that's the end of character generation for Against the Dark Master. In the next video, we'll go into the rules for adventuring. But in the meantime, if you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. But also, please check out my YouTube channel. I have over 100 videos on the channel about tabletop games and fantasy. And if you enjoyed this video, you will likely enjoy many of those other videos as well. Thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you in those videos and many more to come. Later.